Hello, I'm Lucy. And I'm Michelle. Welcome to another Cameo episode. These very short episodes will be slotted in between the other ones and will cover people who made a fleeting yet tantalizing appearance in other episodes. We don't always have a lot of information about them, so they can't have a full episode of their own, but they are too interesting to abandon completely, and they fill in the gaps and enable us to create as full a picture of the era as we can. And today... Martin Schwartz. It sounds like something off of Spaceballs. I don't know Spaceballs. You won't be <laughs> surprised to hear. <laughs> oh, you're going to have to watch that. Oh, all right. God, I've got such a long... You've got a list of books and I've got a list of films. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've done, I did a quick calculation, and I could be wrong here, but I think this is our 100th recording. Ooh. Yay! That's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Martin Schwartz. He was born in Augsburg or Poland. Oh. He's the son of a shoemaker and he was destined for the shoemaking trade, but he had other ideas. I can't really see him as a shoemaker. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you'd get if you ought to jump shoes from him. <laughs> They'd be blood splattered. <laughs> <laughs> It's not known how he went from being a shoemaker to a military entrepreneur in charge of 200 to 500 Swiss soldiers. And a famous one at that. <laughs> yeah. An entrepreneur is the right word because it was a business, trading in killing people. Yes. Or menacing. And it turned out he was very good at both the business and the killing. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> he was very good at keeping his troops well supplied, which is... About the most important thing for a general, really, isn't it? Yeah, but pillaging and looting. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and he, unlike many of the people we've come across, knew the importance of paying mercenaries. Because <laughs> he was one. True, but, uh, yes. Yes. He was apparently temperamentally suited to the job, being a flamboyant, arrogant bully. Mm. And he was renowned for being very brave, but also for being totally ruthless, even pitiless. Mm -hmm. And I said he was a flamboyant. Apparently, he had a love of the bling. Oh, he'd have to cover himself in gold and jewels. But then, if you look at the Swiss soldiers, they all wore really flamboyant clothes. If um, people want to Google the Landsknechts, they look it as if they're going out to a fancy dress party. They don't look dressed for war. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hmm. They're even posing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's almost got, they've almost got the jacket over the shoulder and looking at the watch. And yes, <laughs> look at me. <laughs> I am fancy. <laughs> I know, crazy going into what, presumably, they had other clothes that they changed into. A couple of them actually look like a harlequin. Hmm. With the, how flamboyant the clothing is. And the crossover quartered colours. Huh. Yeah. I bought a book on land snakes and I, yeah, I, was, I was amazed. That is not at all what I pictured. Like, these are fancy, fancy men. Yes. Now, you imagine them with a fair amount of stubble, a, a, a big jaw. Yeah. Shorn hair, an evil glint in their eye. But no, no, they were quite pretty, pretty boys. Yes. <laughs> Schwartz also could put away prodigious amounts of alcohol. Maybe you have to. It sort of goes with the job, I would think. Yeah. I, I think I'd need a, a pint or two before I went into <laughs> battle. A couple of stiff drinks. Yes. The drink and the jewellery made him the butt of jokes of Maximilian's jester, who must have been a very brave man himself, I would think. <laughs> he dresses like them, probably. Yeah. And I don't know if it's the same jester. Do you remember there was one who shared Maximilian's imprisonment in the spice depot in Bruges. Oh, right. And he offered to swap clothes with Maximilian, and he, he probably wished he had, really, because it was the jester was beheaded, not Maximilian. Yeah. Maybe Swartz was behind that. He said, Maybe. I'll just bide my time, but you wait. <laughs> in 1474, Schwartz first made his name at the Siege of Neuss in the Rhineland, where he was knighted. And that siege was Charles the Bold besieging the town because they'd rebelled against the Archbishop of Cologne. And it, it was a complete disaster for Charles. The English bowmen hadn't been paid, and they turned on him. 
and the rumour went out that they'd killed him. So the Burgundians began slaughtering the English until Charles showed himself and said, here I am, please stop killing my soldiers. I need, I need them all. The rest of the siege seemed to consist mainly of drunken brawls between the various nationalities and Charles' army. Eventually, Charles gave up on Noyce and went to Cologne. So that was the edifying bit of chivalry that gained Schwartz his knighthood. Hmm. Maximilian employed Schwartz and his troops ostensibly to get the French out of Flanders, but also to quell the resentment of the people of Flanders about the way Maximilian was behaving. You know, no, I'm only, I'm only getting these soldiers so that we can, uh, we can protect Flanders. Right. Yeah. Once they're in. Go at it. Weed out the troublemakers. Uh. Schwartz and his troops hadn't been paid, so they ran riot around Brussels. And you really didn't want to be there when Schwartz's troops ran riot. In 1483, Schwartz was leading the troops at, in the siege of Nonova, near Brussels. The city was well defended, but he wasn't to be beaten. He concocted a cunning, a cunning plan, whereby, with a group of soldiers, he lured the garrison away and took the city. Now, this was obviously a very cunning plan. Okay. Uh, it earned him a great number of brownie points. But I couldn't find anywhere what he actually did. Oh. How do you lure an entire garrison out? And they dressed as women. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Did they leave little chocolates in a, in a line and they all went, ooh, and followed it out? I don't know. I don't. But whatever it was, it was very cunning. It obviously worked for it mm. to still be in history. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it still be in history as a cunning plan <laughs> and no more. In 1486, he was honoured by Maximilian in that when he took part in the entry into Brussels, he rode on horseback and he was the only person to do that. Even Maximilian went on foot. Oh, that was a little thank you from Maximilian for his military service. And I wondered if that was in lieu of payment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have money, so sit on the horse. <laughs> <laughs> when John the John de la Pole and Francis Lovell turned up at Margaret of York's court, she was very quick to offer them troops, ships, anything to get Henry off the throne. And Schwartz's troops must have been the obvious choice since they were already in the area. We learnt in, in de la Pole and Lovell's episode that actually they were quite late to the party, weren't they? The, um, yes, the troops they were. and everything were, were already amassed by the time mm -hmm. they got there. But the Netherlands were very happy to see Martin Schwartz's men go. Goodbye. <laughs> Don't come back. Yes, thanks. Thanks for everything. Oh. They were very grateful to Margaret of York for deflecting their interest away from Flanders. Mm -hmm. And Maximilian was happy too because Margaret drew up a contract with Martin Schwartz to supply between 1,500 and 2,000 soldiers. So from now on, she'd be paying them and not Maximilian. <laughs> And she'd probably pay them with money, not, not just sitting, yes. sitting on a horse. It was a rough trip from the lowlands to Ireland. I couldn't work out whether Martin Schwartz and his troops were all sick or whether that was just a bit of poetic licence in the book I was reading, but that implied that they were all sitting there ashen-faced or hanging oh. over the side. Anyway, they must have been relieved to arrive in Ireland on the 5th of May, 1487. Lambert Simnel was crowned Edward VI on the 24th in Christchurch Cathedral, Dublin. And we don't really know what Schwartz was up to in his time in Ireland. We know that Schwartz was annoyed that English people didn't flock to John de la Pole as they crossed into Lancashire, but it turns out that his annoyance started long before that. Mm. He, he had assumed, slash been told, that when his troops reached Ireland, they'd be joined by a crack fighting unit, so together they'd be invincible. Right, that's not what happened. No, instead they got Thomas Fitzgerald and his Irish <laughs> army. <laughs> they were all very brave, but they had few weapons, no armour, very little training in modern world warfare. Schwartz must have had that sinking feeling that the whole thing was just going to be a complete fiasco. Yes. We don't actually want to fight and die. We just want to get paid and look menacing in yes. our beautiful clothing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it did look more menacing at the time. It just looks ridiculous now, doesn't it? Yes, it does. On the 4th of June, they landed in Barrow in Lancashire, ready to liberate the country and release it from the tyranny of Henry VII. When they reached terra firma after sailing from Ireland to England, Martin Schwartz would, would immediately have had to put his troops into battle formation, since they could easily be attacked by the forces of Lord Strange from the south or Lord Clifford from the north. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone seeing them, though, would have felt thoroughly intimidated, despite the ludicrous clothes. <laughs> Especially since the German troops would have been arraigning themselves to the sound of the fife and drum. And that was yet unheard in England. Oh. Because we talked in the Patreon episode about Machiavelli suggesting music to accompany yes. the war. Yes. Perhaps not to accompany the war itself, but the entrance into war. So, yeah, uh, Schwartz was doing it. At the mm. battle, Lambert's symbol was only a figurehead. John de Napole had seen action, but he'd never commanded an army. Francis Lovell, who had been up to Scotland, said, just popped up to show everyone I'm here and then disappeared down south again. Leading the Irish, a Thomas Fitzgerald had little or no experience of command. Martin Schwartz was the only one there who knew what he was doing. And probably thinking, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Looking around. <laughs> I think so. But he was of a lower class than the rest of them, and he was foreign, and he was so a mercenary. nobody would listen. Well, I did wonder whether they would, but they do seem to have done so. But he was, you know, he might have been of lower class and foreign, and but he was also extremely intimidating. Mm. <laughs> so I suspect they did listen. Also, John de la Pole had promised that the English would come flocking as soon as they landed on English soil. So where were they? De la Pole, Schwartz and co. had gone over there with only 8,000 troops, intending to expand their forces as they went along. And this didn't happen which must have been incredibly embarrassing for de la Pole, I would think. And Martin Schwartz was justifiably furious. I mean, he was furious because on the, on the whole, as you say, mercenaries didn't fight in battles where they thought they might be killed. Right. That's, that's not what they went into, no, into the job No, they're there for. to get paid. They're not actually there to fight the same way we think of. No. And Schwartz must have been thinking all the way from Lancashire, that he'd inadvertently led his men into what was going to be a very dangerous situation. And the lack of English support put the whole army in a difficult position because they were mostly foreign, um, the German troops and Irish. So now they looked like an invading army rather than a liberating one. English armies relied on their archers, but that wasn't how the Germans fought. So de la Pole must have felt that when they reached Henry VII's army, bristling with archers, that they would be quite a disadvantage. And I wondered about John de la Pole at this, this time. Would you have wanted to traipse across England with a furious Martin Schwartz by your side? No. I don't think I'd have wanted to be anywhere near him when he was in a good mood. Yes, and ensure he's in front of you. Yes. Yeah, I just think de la Pole must have been silently winning people, saying, come, please come, please come, please come. With yes. Schwartz snorting like a bull next to him. But Martin Schwartz's troops were themselves a heterogeneous bunch, comprising Germans, Swiss and Flemings. The Germans and the Swiss use crossbows, halberds and arquebuses. The halberd is a really nasty looking weapon. It has a wicked looking point at the end mm -hmm. and a sharp hook or thorn sticking out the side. Yep. So after you've stabbed with the pointy bit, you tear out the flesh with the hooky bit as you withdraw the yes. weapon. Yeah. That's just, just seems... Yeah. Too much. The arquebus was an early gun, but as we've seen, not very accurate or indeed very safe. The Flemings were experts with the pike. The Irish, on the other hand, mainly had long daggers. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it's a long dagger, a sword. But that's not that long. And they had very little else, certainly no armour. The two armies met at the Battle of Stoke in 1487. The chronicler Hollinshead tells us exactly a hundred years later that, quote, 2,000 Almains, Germans, with one Martin Sward, a valiant and noble captain to lead them, unquote. And he goes on, yeah, he goes on that, quote, both the armies joined and fought very earnestly, and the Germans, being tried and expert men of war, were in all things, as well in strength as policy, equals and matches to the Englishman, unquote. And who's effusive of his praise for, for Schwartz, quote, few of the Englishmen, either in valiant courage or strength and nimbleness of body, was to him comparable, unquote. So it wasn't the completely unfair fight that the casualty numbers might imply. But was it or was he just pumping up Martin Schwartz so Henry's win looked better? Um, this was 100 years later. Uh, I suppose he's still got the... the uh, and how would he know? 
Oh, no, he wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was interesting that he was willing to give Schwartz the benefit of the doubt, really. Yes. And say, no, he was pretty good. Yeah. I mean, he's our enemy, but he was all right. That's a fighter. Mm. Out mm. of desperation, the German pikemen charged, but this was quickly counteracted by the English forces. And only a small number, about 200, survived the battle. And this is where we heard about the poor Irish soldiers looking like hedgehogs because they were so full of arrows. Yes. Schwartz himself was said to have died in a brave but suicidal charge into the vanguard of Henry's army. Swiss chroniclers, however, wrote that he was wounded, captured and then executed on a scaffold over the river. So, really? Yeah. I've never heard that. Did that no. happen? I, th I think it's probably more likely he died in the battle. OK. I don't know where they I got thought. that from. Yeah. OK. The site of his death was said to have been at Willow Runnel, and he was said to have been buried with a willow stake through his body, and from that one plant a willow grove grew, which is quite likely. I mean, willow cuttings take very easily, I think. <laughs> so <laughs> Plenty of iron. Yes, yes. <laughs> but Martin Schwartz's <laughs> reputation lived on after his death. For a start, there's a place called Swarth Swarthmore, a swamp near the place where Schwartz landed with his troops and named after him. Sounds like a coincidence to me, but it could be true. Why would you name something after somebody who invaded and then died? Well, there was a, I've forgotten his name now, a noble living around there who was helping them. Oh. So yeah, it's not impossible, but yeah, hmm. I think it will leave it. Bernard Andre compared him to Diomedes, the king of Argos, a renowned leader, one of the seventh against Thebes and friend of Odysseus. But then um, he would. Yeah, but I don't know. That, that seems a bit much. Yeah, especially since Andre is, is writing in the time of Henry VII. Yeah. Schwartz and his men became bogeymen, something to frighten the children with, just as Napoleon would be later. <laughs> And songs were sung about him like an evil Robin Hood. The poet John Skelton wrote a poem in 1527 called Against a Comely Custron. And a custron was a kitchen boy, which included the lines With hay trolley lolly low whip here, Jack, alum bet sodildim sillerim ben. Curiously, he can both counter our knack of Martin Schwartz and all his merry men. Ooh. In William Wager's 1560s play called The Longer Thou Livest, The More Fool Thou Art. <laughs> the fool, Moros, sings the lines Martin Schwartz and his men, Soddledum, Soddledum. <laughs> Martin Schwartz and his men, Soddledum, Soddledum, Bell. And I will find that. And you know this, don't you? I know this. Because Shadow it is. Of the Tower. Henry sings it in one of the scenes. And I will play it now. Yeah. Was Henry the Seventh in the shadow of the tower, bored in the tent. <laughs> it was, but obviously, if Henry the Seventh knew this song, he must have been clairvoyant because it was written fifty years <laughs> after he was. <laughs> <laughs> and Schwartz actually appears in the shadow of the tower. He, yes, he does. He had one line. Can you remember what it was? No. Ah, well, here we go. Oh, I've done plenty. It was when they're in Ireland. Yeah. And they're crowning Lambert Simnel with the crown off of their statue of Mary. Yeah, and this is what he says. John Lane? Yes, Lord. I wish to pay my respects to the Earl of Warwick. Brave those crowds and bring that boy in here at once. Drag him in by the heels if you have to, my lord. That's and take Schwartz with you. He has the taste for a roughhouse and the style, haven't you, Schwartz? <laughs> <laughs> That's his entire line. His <laughs> laughter. <laughs> That's his line. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> yeah. So Schwartz was famous even beyond the Elizabethan era. In the 1630s, not only did John Ford write a play, 
called Perkin Warbeck, and in the list of people who were said to have died for him, he includes, quote, bold Martin Schwartz, unquote, showing that he really should have done his homework. <laughs> <laughs> but there was also a play called Martin Schwartz that now sadly no longer exists. Oh. But, but we know it didn't do very well at the box office because it only brought in 48 shillings, which apparently wasn't great for the period. <laughs> So that was the life and the afterlife of Sir Martin Schwartz, mercenary, entrepreneur and jewel-encrusted bully. Wow. That was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, we need some sort of ending <laughs> Yeah, that was good. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye.